ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुदेव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम I bow to my guru in all of you. I would like to read from the book Conversations with Yogananda. The Columbia professor to whom I referred last time had a probing mind. Among many questions he asked, how do you distinguish between yourself and your followers? Now this answer that Yogananda ji my guru gave is very interesting because usually you think in the world that people who are bigger are taller more important more um you might say uh ablaze in the world he gives exactly the opposite explanation all our waves on the same one ocean the master replied composed as ocean water is of the same substance spirit some of the waves are higher than others some waves don't even want to distance them dis- distance themselves from the ocean all waves no matter how high are in essence one and the same the difference between the guru and the disciples then lies only in their respective closeness to the ocean in how conscious each one is of his essential reality the greater the sense of ego the taller the wave and the greater in consequence the ignorance the greater one's awareness of the ocean as one's soul reality the smaller the wave and also the less his sense of having a separate individuality well, that's a fascinating answer because in the world we always think in terms of importance when we think of oh a guru would be somebody important in our lives what makes him important and this is what i always saw living with my guru whenever i would touch his feet he would always put his hand like that meaning i direct your devotion to god i do not accept it for myself when people spoke of us as his disciples he said i don't have disciples they are god's disciples I am not the guru he is the guru there was no sense of ego it was an amazing experience for me because you know living in the world and uh, mixing with ego centered people i would always see a glimmer of likes dislikes i am you i i don't like you i do like you etc etc all the reactive process that goes up to make an ego all our little thoughts are like vortices this is why patanjali said yoga chitta vritti nirod yoga is the neutralization of all these little vortices of ego the ego spins around itself its likes and dislikes its desires and aversions and what the guru does is gradually eliminate this this is the essence of yoga to let go all those little vortices and there are two ways of doing so it's sort of like a river when you have a little brook in the mountains you'll see that on the side of the brook there are many little eddies little vortices but when the stream is very strong it sucks them all along with that current and dissolves all of them so there are different ways but the slow way is to try to release each vortex the fast way which is the technique that my guru taught known as kriya yoga the kriya yoga of lahiri mohashai of benares because there are many kriya yogas this is the technique of kriya that he taught the kriya yoga of lahiri mohashai in that you get this stream of energy in the spine which dissolves in a uh, very much shorter order all these little vortices now the difference between the guru and the disciples is not that the guru is more important bigger taller um more imposing he was 
very imposed in him, but it wasn't him that he imposed. He didn't impose himself. He never said, I want this or I like that. The amazing thing about it was that he, in a way, he didn't exist. I never could get over it. It was always like when I was with him, it was as if I was in the presence of God. I'll never forget one time I was out at the, with the monks had a retreat out in the desert, and uh, our master's retreat was about five miles down the road. And one night, I woke up and I felt that God himself was in the room, and I just, I felt so wonderful and so uplifted. I sat there and meditate, and then I heard a little noise out of doors, and I looked, and he was walking up and down outside. That was the power of his presence, that wherever he went, even strangers would feel it. You know, sometimes he would walk up and down outside an area in, New in Los Angeles where there were lots of bars and very worldly places, and he would just walk quietly. I know what he was doing. He was just changing the consciousness of the people. His work in this world was more on a level of consciousness than in words. But sitting in his presence, I would feel, sometimes he might be talking about something very ordinary, like, oh, uh, potholes that needed to be fixed in the driveway or something. And because that wasn't particularly my job at the time, I could sort of not be involved in, yes, yes, we'll do this, yes, we'll do that, or won't do that. But I would just sit there and feel, and I would feel this great freedom come over me, the emanation of a great guru. This is what his presence and what his reality is. There was a disciple who used to take a lot of photographs and sort of plaster his wall like, like a wallpaper with photographs. One time, Master, as we called him, said to him, why do you keep taking pictures of this bag of bones and flesh? He said, get to know me in meditation, then you'll know who I really am. Well, I found, after a time, as I sought to tune in with him, that that's who he really was, not this body, not this seeming beautiful face, but it wasn't he. There was something behind there. That's something that began to be planted more and more in me also. This is the job of a disciple, you know, to try to become one with the guru, to try to be a window through which the guru can express himself, just as he was a window onto the infinite. You know, there was an interesting experience I had many years ago. I had an office at the, in the ashram at a big picture window, and I used to look from my desk sometimes and enjoy the garden because it was a lovely green flowery garden. And one day there was a big rainstorm, and the rain water splattered mud on the window, and I could no longer really enjoy the uh, scene because of all this splattered mud. Well, I was busy, or perhaps you want to say lazy, I won't argue, but it took me a couple of weeks before I really got out there and cleaned the window. But having lived with that muddy, splattered window for two weeks, when I stepped back, I said, oh, what a beautiful window. And then I smiled, because I realized the reason I was saying the window was beautiful was because I couldn't see the window anymore. I could see the garden through it. And then I thought, that's what my guru is. He's a window onto the infinite. What makes him beautiful is not he, but what shines through him. As he used to say to us, I killed Yogananda long ago. No one dwells in this temple now but God. And I have to say that living with him made God a reality. Now there's a very interesting thing that conversation goes on here. The professor said, is there a difference then of evolution? Since Yogananda said there's no difference really between the disciple and the guru, except the guru is less there. It's more God coming through, but it's all God. And so the master said, that much is true. If we understand evolution to mean a progressive refinement of awareness, 
The tall waves participate more exuberantly in the play of delusion. The little waves, which are more enlightened, are no longer excited by the play. Enlightened beings enjoy everything, not for itself, but as a play of God's. Now, that's such a wonderful thought, that being a yogi doesn't mean you become apathetic. I remember there was this one old yogi I met down in Puri in Orissa. He was 130-something years old, not, not a young fellow. And he was telling me that you should enjoy anything. I said, when there's a beautiful sunrise, shouldn't I enjoy it? Nope. I don't agree. And thank God my guru didn't agree. You should agree. You should enjoy. But enjoy with the joy of God. The path that he taught us was not one of apathy, not one of disdain, not one of aloofness to the God's creation. My God, God created it for his enjoyment and to enjoy it through us. He wants us to enjoy it, but in the right way. How can we enjoy it in the right way? With his joy. How can we enjoy it with his joy? By remembering that when you see that beautiful sunrise, it's in you that you're feeling that beauty. It's in you that you're feeling that joy. And another person might look at a sunrise, and if he's an artist, let's say, he might say, oh, I bet I could paint a better sunrise than that. Well, that's ego. If you're going to refer everything back to yourself, or there's another thing that you could think too. You're watching the sunrise and you're thinking, oh my God, another half hour before I can eat. Your, stomach, your mind goes back to your body, to your stomach, to your aches and pains, to your headaches, whatever it might be, the ants crawling. If you can forget yourself, you can enjoy the world. The world is most enjoyable if you enjoy it with the joy of God. Now, this is what Yogananda taught us. I've mixed with many saints in India. I've had the opportunity to be in... Um, oh, probably with 20 of the saints, some of them very great, some of them wonderful, some of them less so. Well, you have to expect that too. And uh, I have seen that the ability to enjoy is surely a part of a true saint's consciousness. Now, I know that there have been saints that I have met who have been very, when you see their smile, it's just a slight smile, but you look into their eyes, and there's joy there. It isn't as if they have to go ho, 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 being jolly, not at all. But you know that that joy that you feel when you're watching a beautiful sunrise, when you see a beautiful smile, when you see goodness in this world, yes, there's a mixture of everything. There's a mixture of evil and good, of hatred and love, a mixture of suffering and sorrow. My Param 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 Guru Babaji Maharaj up in the Himalayas said that this world is a mixture of sand and sugar. He said, be like the wise ant. Separate the sugar from the sand. We must learn to look at this world for the sugar. We must look for the sweetness. I remember I used to love to go and visit Ananda Mohima. She was a wonderful woman, saint. She gave me some sweets one time, and she said, Shab shomoy mishti khao. Always eat sweetness. This is how the saints teach us to be, to see sweetness in everywhere. And how can you do it? You won't do it if you're looking at the waves bouncing up and down. You won't look at it, uh, you won't see it if you see the differ differences. But you will see it if you realize that underneath all those waves, there's that one unifying consciousness. And so the last part of this saying, which I have always found extremely interesting, the professor said, is there any end to evolution? The master replied, no end. You go on until you achieve endlessness. What a fantastic answer. There's no end to it all. There's no, fine, uh, no final goal that you have to reach. You, 
you know, it's so hard to believe because we always see living in this world beginnings and endings. We see causes and effects. But the infinite, you are that infinite. Do you know how old you really are? No, you're not 20 or 40 or 60 or like me, nearly 80. You're not that. You're eternal. You're as old as Brahman. You have no age. There's a saying in the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which Yogananda interpreted, and I wrote an explanation, or I should say I edited his explanation, in which he says, Omar Khayyam says, that many people who came out into manifestation at the, day of a, at the beginning of the day of Brahman, billions of years ago, will still be wandering in delusion at the end of that day of Brahman. Do you want to wander that long? Well, they do. That's why they do it. You only wander as long as you want to. God isn't keeping you here. God isn't making you a prisoner. He wants to free you. But the trouble is that you don't like to be free because you think, oh, yes, yes, freedom would be nice, moksha would be beautiful, but let me get that little thing first. You know, they had a test in America of people in different income brackets, from the lowest to the highest. And they asked each group of people, are you happy with the income you get? The average answer throughout all these different brackets was, well, we would be happy if we had 10% more. That 10% represents an entire day of Brahman, an entire day of seeking, and always thinking, I've got it, and then you don't. It's like quicksilver. You think you've grabbed it, and it flies out of your reach. And you think you've got happiness, and it flies out of your reach. How can you really be happy? Well, the answer is really quite simple. Meditate. Calm your mind. Attune your mind to God. Listen to his voice. Listen for his guidance. Don't say, I want this, I want that. I have seen in my life that every time I did that, things went wrong. But every time I let him do it, oh yeah, it didn't always seem so easy. Sometimes what he seemed to want of me was just the opposite of what I thought he ought to want. But I found time and again that when I listened, when I accepted, even the worst possible seeming choice worked out perfectly. His will is our happiness. He doesn't want us to suffer. We're the ones who suffer because we go against that will. So I pray for you that you find that in your life. Namaskar. Life is a dream, time like a stream carries our burdens away. Never despair, joys everywhere, love can befriend you today. Free from all care, like birds on the air, soar above griefs and worries, seek joy and be gay. Sometimes a friend helps us ascend up from life's cares to the sky. Love is a star, though shining afar. It can guide us and help us toward light to draw nigh. Life is a dream. Free from all 
draw 